Welcome to Zootown Church Online, and thanks for joining us. Right behind me is where you would normally sit if you were here in person, and we are doing a building project right now, so if you ever get to do join us, we look forward to seeing you live. However, it also costs us money to produce these videos, not just the technology and the software, but also a staff member to make sure that your experience goes well. Your money also goes to different organizations that we've partnered with, not just in Missoula, but also across the world with missionary groups. So although this doesn't really affect you, this building, it does cost money for us to produce these videos. So we're asking you to partner with us. If you watch online or you consider this your home church, we're glad that you did, but we're all also asking that you partner with us financially, because once again, as the things I've just described, it costs money to do this. So please look at your bank accounts, talk to Jesus, and consider partnering with Zootown Church financially financially. The best way to do that is online so you can scan this QR code or go online and set up your weekly giving. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the service. So this is where we talk about the nuts and bolts. Obviously it costs money to do this. You get the vision and the heart behind it, but this is how we do it. And this is why we're remodeling the auditorium uh, in the warehouse. We wanna give you some hard numbers in just a minute, but really just to know that it is hard to sell this. And the reason why is most of the money goes to things that we like to say aren't sexy. Like no one really cares about HVAC. No one really cares about sound dampening until it blows your ears out. But most people don't understand the cost of these things. And even right now in the world, everything has gone up so much. I mean, you're feeling the pinch, I'm feeling the pinch, but everything has gone up so much that it is hard to sell these things because as Americans, we like to see it. We like to feel it. We like to touch it. And a lot of these things just aren't that. But we also want to be a place that's state of the art. We want to be a place that has good visual, good sound, because that obviously matters. As I like to say, no matter what neighborhood you drive through in the Missoula area, rich or poor, most places have a 50 inch flat screen, which means visual is very important. But this stuff just costs a lot, a lot of money. But it is a one time expense for a long term investment in Zootown Church. And so we'll have you hear some hard numbers now of what it's actually going to cost and what your money's going to go to for us to get in to this place. It takes a ton of technology to make a Sunday morning service happen. Uh, this room right here, probably most of you have not been in. It's the central hub. We call it Overwatch. Uh, most of the technology comes into this space and that makes Sunday happen both in the room and online. All of our, our sound, our lighting, our video all comes into this space. So as we get ready to move into a new location, it's going to take a fair amount of finances just to move it over into that space. It could be $32,000 plus just to run the cabling and get everything into that space. And that's not including any upgrades that we're looking to make happen for that as well. We're hoping to eventually host concerts and, and plays and different events into that space. And as a result of that, we're gonna need to upgrade some of the things that we have uh, in place already. So things like speakers, um, in order to bring concerts in, there's a certain level of speakers that need uh, to be in place to have, to meet writers for bands. And uh, so for us, we're looking at $65,000 just for the speakers. Now that can seem like a lot, but if you look at the Wilma, when they upgraded in there, they spent a million dollars just on their sound uh, reinforcement. So we're trying to do this as fiscally responsible as we can, but we have to meet certain thresholds in order for that to happen. We'd like to give you a quick tour of the new space and Ty is gonna give you a couple more numbers uh, in regards to what that looks like as well. Hey Zootown, we're excited to give you a glimpse into the new auditorium space that's currently under construction. We realize it looks like a mess right now, but it is uh, taking shape every day. The improvements are amazing. It's fun to watch. 
it's an exciting mess for sure. And it's gonna be, every time we come in here, we get that much more excited for what it's eventually gonna look like. Uh, just standing in this space and looking out what, what it's gonna look like from our perspective, and then going back over to the, um, to the seated area and seeing what it's gonna look like from everybody else's perspective. We're just, we get more and more excited every week when we come in here. So we're excited to show you the space in more detail. Come on, let's take a look. So we're gonna take you up in the balcony. Let's check it out. Oh, look, they're putting the barrier up. Yeah. So part of the way we've designed the building is uh, obviously for a concert venue, so optimum sound uh, to the best we can. And so one of the ways we've done that is to try to create sound paneling in the walls as opposed to having to affix it to the walls later on. So because of the building was already constructed, has cement exterior walls, we've furred out walls in, in front of those, and then we're using the insulation and wall cavity that we've created to trap and contain the sound that's generated at a concert. So typical Sunday morning, we experience, uh, you know, concert sounds measured in decibels, so it's about 95 dB generally. This is where a concert, like a live concert venue, is often 110 to 115 dB. And so building a facility that captures that sound and enhances it so that you can hear it and enjoy it is, is uh, pretty paramount to do from the construction side of things, um, as opposed to coming back and trying to retrofit later, um, which costs more and takes more time. We put, this is six inches, and they'll put another six inches right in front of it for the base tramp. That, yeah, so this will have a, uh, that Owens Corning 703 over the face of it. And then those, um, those big panels, the eight of them will be at a cant like this, coming out from the floor and up. And I think up high enough that they're not like protruding into the hallway. Oh, sure. It's like we said, there's so much stuff in here that uh, you probably will never see, never notice, uh, that's super important to what we're doing and it can be kind of expensive. Like for instance, they're hanging right now uh, this black barrier on this wall that's really important to keep the sound trapped uh, both in the space on either side of the wall and that's $9,800 just for to hang that up on the wall. And you'll never see it because we're gonna go put sheetrock over top of it and uh, uh, it'll just look like any other wall, but it's super important to what we're doing. So another portion of the building that uh, you have to contain sound in is a stage. A stage basically becomes um, like a big resonant chamber. So it just vibrates, it captures sound, and it has a hollow space below it that can reverberate and, and really make what you're hearing as an audience member something other than what's intended. So to, to combat that, you have to lay down another layer of sound barrier, which they call it decoupling, separates kind of all the sound transfer from above the stage to below it. And then we lay another sheet of CDX plywood over the top of it so you have a, a finish that's usable. But all of this costs a bunch of money and it's something you never see. It's something you know that most people are, are unaware exists in a stage, but is required to produce a sound in an environment that's conducive to what we're trying to do with church and with concerts and any other you know type of event that we would host here. So as you can see. We're excited to be moving forward with the expansion, phase two, the auditorium. It's a big part of the project that we're trying to do here at Zootown. Um, we're excited that you've partnered with us so far. Uh, to that end, you can see that basically all of the interior is being constructed. We have the funding to do all of that work. What we're looking for now is additional funding to actually move into the space and, and outfit it with all of the equipment and items necessary to conduct Sunday services, concerts, and use it as a venue in the community around us. We're looking for an additional two to $300,000 to really do all of the things that we're hoping to in that space. 
So we really hope that you can catch the vision of Zootown Church and what we're trying to do in the community around us and partner with us financially in the months ahead. If you can, I just, I am so bad at asking oh, for money. So, so bad at asking for money. Is there anybody that's really good at it? No, I don't know. Some people are. <laughs> Y'all think we're cool, calm, and collected, don't you? Well, yeah, if you were here the last few weeks, again, we're uh, moving into just explaining the why we're doing this. And so the first two weeks were who we are, because if you're going to be a part of Zootown Church, you should know what we believe. So it was more like spiritual, theological, uh, cultural, and now we're moving into the why. Why do we even meet? What's church for? Like, why did we even get together today? Well, I've probably mentioned this before, um, but here's one kind of trick that I started doing at weddings. And I've, I've done 30 plus weddings at this point, and I've seen some really good ones, I've seen some really bad ones. Uh, if I'm honest with you, I kind of struggle with weddings at this point in life because they've just gotten so far off what they're even for uh, and, and what they intended to be. Uh, not to mention all the money that is spent on them, but I do it to bless people. But there's one thing that I did a few years ago that really helped everything because I was so tired of weddings getting interrupted. I was so tired of honestly just selfish people at weddings because most of the time, I mean, there's times when like I'm giving a message and the bride and the groom are, are there just, you know, in their moment and someone will walk through the aisle and get to their spot. It just disrupts everything. And most of the time it's just people drinking in the parking lot. And especially now that most weddings aren't in a church, it's usually in some field <laughs> at some ranch. There's just people everywhere. So what I started doing is if uh, the couple has alcohol at their wedding, I asked them to tap the keg before the wedding and put it right behind where we're going to do the ceremony. And uh, at first, they always kind of give me a strange look, but it works. And how it works is it's called the watering hole. And basically, instead of all the people wandering around, they, it, it makes people have a center point. It makes them have a spot of reference. And it really just herds people to a point to where we can then give direction. So instead of having the mother-in-law yelling at everybody in the field, we now have one spot that people are at, and it's a center point to know where they should go. And then now, when they see me walk to the front, usually people get the clue and get the hint of what they should do. And it works that many different people at a wedding, many different backgrounds, many different reasons why they're there, but the center point is that couple and that keg unifies everybody to know where to go. That is what church is for. That is what a building is for. I get there's lots of different views on what to spend on a building and all that stuff, and I could get into that. Most of the time people just don't know, but I thought Dan and Ty did a good job that it's just, it's just a different time, a different era. There's city codes that we have to meet and all kinds of stuff. But it is a center point for direction. That's why we meet, spiritual direction, community direction. And so we need a place and a center for that, and that is what church is. And I don't just mean Zootown Church. I mean, that's what the church was for. Now, I think the church gets off sometimes on what it's even for, but we're here to, to make things simple again on why we meet and what we do. And so let's just do a little tour of the history of the church. So when the first church got started, I mean the Christian church, they met in synagogues. They met in the synagogues. You see that in the book of Acts, that just because they were followers of Jesus, they didn't look at it like it was a brand new religion. They looked at it like it was a continuation of Judaism. Judaism was uh, the first people group that encountered the spirit of the living God and got that direction. But here's what they miss, is that, you know, the Jews kind of made that inward focus, but they were meant, the Jewish people were meant to share the knowledge of God with the world. And we see hints of that when uh, the Queen of Sheba went and met with Solomon and all kinds of things, but they did get kind of inward focus because really they were a nation and a religion together. But the early church did not view this as a separate thing. They looked at it as a fulfillment of what the Old Testament was all about. Israel represents all of humanity and our wanderings through the desert, right? It, they represented humanity, but God did choose one nation, and they were the weakest nation, by the way, 
to have one Messiah come out of, and it was the Jewish people. However, it was for the world. And so they met in synagogues and they carried on some of the practices, but they let go of other practices because they no longer needed them because it had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They also met, they did meet in public. There were seasons of peace with the early church. They weren't getting thrown to the lions all the time. And they met in public squares. They met in places where they did plays, coliseums. They met in schools. They also met in homes, but they were a part of the bigger church. And so again, throughout the church history, there's been movements of the home church. And they always say, you know, the big church sucks, so we're starting a home church. There's a place for the home church. There really is. But it's a lie to say that all the, that the church was just always in homes. That wasn't the case. They met in public, and the home church was a uh, um, kind of a side thing, or it was a part of the church, but it was just something else of the church. But they, they met in homes. And then if you look at the Old Testament, it's obvious it was always pointing towards the cross. Excuse me, they met in public. Look at how the ancient Israelites, when they would gather together at the tabernacle, look at what it looked like. You need, I don't need to explain this, right? Okay, I will, it's a cross. So that means even in the Old Testament, it was always pointing towards the cross. It was always point, pointing towards the unification of the body coming together under God. In second century, we, they have architecture now, excuse me, archeology, span that they have found churches where people gather. They started building churches as close to the end of the first century into the second century. We actually have some churches from 300 AD that are still around. They still exist. What they started doing though, is when they built these churches, a lot of people think it was just for show. That's not true. 90 some percent of the people were illiterate. They couldn't read. So you couldn't just hand them a Bible to understand the story. So they started painting these beautiful pictures around the church so people could have a visual of what the story means. So when you wonder why we're spending so much money on screens and stuff like that, it's because we are a visual people. We always have been. They just didn't have LED technology 2,000 years ago. But those images were to depict a story, and so we use visual to depict the story, to help come alongside so we can visualize these things. Fast forward to America. Let's just look at the American uh, people. They, the Puritans were the first ones. People think that the Puritans, the first thing they did was build a church. That's actually not true. The first thing the Puritans did was build a pub. That's the first thing they did. But if you actually read some of it, the churches and the pubs were together. So the church and the pub came together, but it was really for a community center. It was the place where people got guidance. It was the place where people got direction. And we're gonna look at that next week in what Zootown means to the community, but today, Let's do a quick recap of Zootown Church. We were birthed out of a coffee shop in 2009 called Zootown Brew. Now Liquid Planet's down there downtown, but we were called Zootown Brew. It wasn't very profound how I came up with the name. We were actually the first group that used Zootown as their name. Now they're everywhere, right? Now it's Zootown this, Zootown that. How I, it wasn't really profound. I was thinking of a name. I drove into Missoula. Someone spray painted on the side of, the, of, a, of a sign, welcome to Zootown. And I go, there it is. There it is. So we started Zootown Brew to be in the community. A year later, we launched the church. Years after that, as we grew, we weren't even looking on this side of town. We wanted to stay kind of downtown area but we'd look at a building and we wouldn't get it or it wasn't right and we just kept moving this way. Finally, do you remember the old Cine 3 just down the road? That place smelled terrible, if you remember it. But it was dollar movies, right? It was dollar movies. So we looked at that and it seemed so big to us. But they wanted a ridiculous amount of money for that building and this building, which is still known as the Vans building, whenever we tell people we're at, we still say the Vans building and we're okay with that and I'll explain why. We looked at it and it just seemed enormous, like so far out of reach. But we met with Pete and Patricia Van and particularly Patricia. She was a follower of Jesus Christ. They were, they were, um, they gave a lot of money to uh, Youth for Christ and stuff like that. 
And you could, if you know the story of the Vans, it was a heartbreaking story. They built their entire business up. They were a staple in Montana. Uh, and then some bad things happened. But they lost it. But they owned the buildings. And Patricia, I can remember this day, she said, I want this building to go to something positive. They carried the loan for us. We did not have to take a loan out. They carried it for us with interest-only payments to get us on our feet. We would never have been in here without a good Christian woman like Patricia Van. What was interesting is we held an information meeting for people to see it and, and, and get the vision. We had a lot of people leave because it was too big and our dreams were too big. Well, nah, 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 nah. No, just joking. <laughs> but they left because they couldn't catch the vision. Well, we are big thinkers here. We are big thinkers here. Our goal was always to move into that warehouse. But we ran into a few issues. We had COVID. We had staff changes. We had tons of things. And we were a little behind. But here we are. We're moving in. Eventually, we're, I'm going to talk about this in the last week, but we're going to move the children's area into here. We have lots of visions beyond this, but here's where we're at. But why? Why? So again, the first two weeks were spiritual, theological, practical, who we are. Go listen to those messages if you weren't here. But why are we doing this? We, uh, we want to use that room for many different things. So here it is. First and foremost, we are doing this for the church. For the church. Early on, we were so evangelistic focused because I am an evangelist and we are to evangelize the world. And I won't explain what that actually means, but we got so focused on the out, we didn't do a great job at handling the in. We were really, really wide, not very deep. So that's one of the changes we've made through theology and spiritual practices and all those things. But first and foremost, this is for the church. We believe, the leaders of this church, we wouldn't do this if we didn't believe in the church of Jesus Christ in all her black and blue eyes. We wouldn't have stuck this out. We believe in the church. And I just wanna say this, that we are 14 years old. Next September is our 15th anniversary. We believe this is just the start of Zootown Church. We, we are a completely different church in many ways. Some of you have been here from the beginning, and you know that. But why are we doing this? Why are we going to build this huge place with the people we have now? Because we believe we are a part of this reformation, and we believe it's coming and it's here. We are a part of this. And so we want to build the space now to get ready, not just size-wise, but depth-wise, which we believe we're there now, for this influx of people. There's a lot I could say about that <laughs> when it comes to Christians in Missoula, but I digress. I'm here to give whoever's here the good news of Jesus Christ, but we are building a space in anticipation because we believe there's a reformation going on right now. With all the craziness going on in the world, there are people who are longing and seeking and hearing the voice of Jesus Christ, and we want to be a safe place for them to hear the actual good news. Hebrews 11 says this, now faith is being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. Now let's be honest, this is the opposite of how us Americans work. This is why faith is so hard for us Americans. We wanna track it, we wanna gauge it, we wanna see a pie graph for it. We wanna know exactly if this is gonna work out, right? That's not faith. It's just not. So again, let me say this. We are leaders in this reformation. We are going to hold that tightly. Now, let me also say this, that Montana is always 10 years behind everything. There's some good to that. There's some good to that. But this movement is, is already started in the world and it's just catching up to Montana. And we wanna be ready for that. We are gonna take the mantle that God has given us. 
that we are leaders in the Reformation. And again, if, if you've heard me speak, I've already speak on all that. But what I love about it is there's Catholics in here, there's people who've left the church and come back, there's people who've had terrible experiences at church, great experiences at church. There's Presbyterians, there's Charismatics, there's all these different people at Zootown Church. You've seen the good, you've seen the bad, you've seen the ugly. We wanna be a place that takes all those things and reforms them for good, for good. The only other option is that we become cynics. That's the only other option. Well, we don't wanna do that because we believe in God's church. For those who are saying the church is dead, no, it will never die. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. However, it's being reformed. It's, it will never die. So we wanna be a part of that and we want to embrace that. But here's the difference now from when I was a 27-year-old punk. Okay, here's the difference. We totally believe revival's happening right now. The difference is, is we're not gonna tell you and tell God what revival looks like. If I asked a lot of you, particularly Protestants, that word revival gets brought up a lot. What does revival look like? Is it people rolling on the floor, speaking in tongues? Is it people getting baptized? Is it just more people? Is that what revival looks like? This reformation is a revival and it's gonna look like something that we don't, we can't com comprehend, meaning we can't box it, we can't gauge it, we can't say this is it. It's gonna be a movement of God and a spirit of God where we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. So that's the difference of then and now. What we used to do is I think a lot of it worked, but we created this scenario, we created something to work, and then when it worked, we're the ones who created it. <laughs> The difference is now we hold everything loosely and we're gonna walk in this with some humility, we're gonna walk with this in repentance and we're gonna walk with this in grace. This is not a cult. You can leave whenever you want. You don't have to wear black outfits every week. I'm not here to make any of you do anything. If you sin, welcome to the human race, okay? That's the difference is we have a vision that you can come along but we're not gonna make it so tight that you have to be this, 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 and this, and do this, because then we squash God. We want a movement of God that looks like God, not look like man. So that's the difference from where we are before. And praise God, he uses our ignorance even in all that. But again, this reformation is a return to depth. We are looking for serious people, not perfect people. Okay? We are looking for serious people, but not perfect people. Uh, when Brian Zond was here, I had many conversations with him, but he went through what we did 20 years ago, and he survived, and now he's thriving. But he got a new worship leader, uh, and this worship leader came from one of the largest churches in America. He gave up a very good job, and he told Brian, I just couldn't do it anymore. And what he meant by that was they spent more time creating a show, creating what, what people would respond to, having the right look, having the right this, and claim that to be God when really any atheist can set up a good church service to look like a church service. We are not satisfied with that. We believe a movement of God is repentance. We believe a move of God is, is a little sticky. We believe a movement of God is where God, you feel Christ and it's not manufactured. It's not saying the right words. It's not saying the right prayers. You know what my favorite prayers are? What the heck, God? That's my favorite prayer now. But at the end of all my prayers, I say, thy will be done. So that's what we say. We have dreams, we have visions, but it's thy will be done. But the whole, the whole show part of church, we want to do things with excellence, but we're not going to manipulate you into anything. Okay? And that's important. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So the early church, they met daily. They met daily. And definitely they met weekly. It really was their life. Why? They had persecution. They, a lot of them were poor. But really, if you read the early church, they had seen the world, like, exhaust its flesh. And they were looking for something deep in the spirit. Here's the thing. I don't want anyone to hear this in shame. Please don't hear this in shame. If five of you showed up next week, I'm gonna give the liturgy and I'm gonna give the Eucharist. That's where I'm at. But the stats are in. If you go to church twice a month, you are in the majority for church, meaning like you're going to church more than the average person. 
the average person's going about once every six weeks. I don't mean this to complain, I don't. It is hard to direct, <laughs> it's hard to direct a church sometimes when no one's here, like all the time. I don't expect you to be here every week, I really don't. And I don't even know, by the way, I don't know. But something's, something's changed, something's changed. And I'll get into that in just a minute. But what about you? I just gotta ask you that. You, only you can decide that. But something's changed. So basically they say on a, week, on a weekly service, you have to double your congregation because not everyone comes all the time anymore. I wanna show you the importance of this. Again, not out of shame, not out of guilt, but just the importance that something's been lost. I really believe American, what's, what do we hold dear more than anything in America? Besides football. Freedom. Our freedoms. Our individual rights and freedoms. Now, I think there's wonderful things to that. But it's our main focus. And I just want you to hear this out. Individualism disposes each citizen to isolate himself from the mass of those like him and to withdraw to one side with his family and friends where he willingly abandons society at large to itself. Democracy has a fracturing effect on people who spurred by dreams of great happiness focus their efforts on securing a pleasant future for themselves and their family rather than immersing themselves in the wider community of neighborhood, town, state, and country. Something's changed, okay? Something's changed. COVID, we're almost four years into this now, and we're still blaming it for everything. COVID did two things. It either pushed people away because we got one life, we gotta live this, we, gotta, I mean, we could die. It either pushed people away to live this YOLO life or it brought people closer to God. It, it, it did one or the other, it really did. And as I said, fear creates selfishness. In my own life, whenever I'm afraid, I don't really care about you or anything else. It creates selfishness. And so there's been this shift with this. Now, I'm not a cynic. I believe God tears everything down to rebuild it. But only you can answer that. Only you can answer where you're at with that. And if you're here today, I'm probably speaking to the wrong crowd, right? But it's more than that, prosperity. Prosperity, comfort has, has taken our need away for God. And we have so many other options. We have so many other options now. We are entertained to the gills. There's never a lack of entertainment. Now again, I'm not a stick in the mud. I went to Coldplay two weeks ago in Seattle. It was awesome. Uh, Jerry Lynn, our youth leader, was there, and we went with a bunch of uh, people. It was wonderful. At one point, it was so stimulating, I had to sit down and close my eyes. And I looked over, and Jerry Lynn's sitting there like this, too. <laughs> like, there's not a lack of stimulation or entertainment in our world. So what do we do when we come into boring old church? You need to look at it differently. You need to look at church as a place to get away from that, actually. And it's a way to work on your soul. I can't get the feeling back of Coldplay. but every week I can come and get my soul refreshment. So we need to change this. And again, this, none of this is a knock on anybody. It's where we're at. 20 years ago, my mentor said, they're gonna start playing kids sports on Sundays and it's gonna take more families out of church. Here we are. Sports are an idol. And what do we do? I don't have an answer for it. I really don't. I have two kids and my, my daughter's playing volleyball right now. So here's just a suggestion I have. You map out your entire year. Do you map out when you're gonna go to church? Or is it just like, eh, when I can? I hear a lot of people say, I want my kids to love the church when they're older. Are you modeling that right now? Again, please don't hear shame and guilt. That's not what it is. But Jesus said, this is what I give you, and it's called the church. And I really think some people can't figure out why they're displaced in their life when we're just not obeying God to be with the fellowship of believers. Again, if you're going into it thinking, I'm gonna feel this way and I'm gonna feel this way, then you're gonna miss it. And then honestly, you're God. But it does take a discipline. This is how serious some of the old school dudes were. This is John Wesley. To separate ourselves from the body of living Christians with whom we were before united is a grievous breach of the law of love. 
It is the nature of love to unite us together, and the greater the love, the stricter the union. And while this continues in its strength, nothing can divide those whom love has united. It is only when our love grows cold that we can think of separating from our brethren. And this is certainly the case with any who willingly separate from their Christian brethren. The pretenses for separation may be innumerable, but want of love is always the real cause. Otherwise, they would still hold the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I want to also stop and just say, I don't know your church history. I don't, I don't, I don't know that. Some of you have been majorly hurt in church. I'm really sorry. I mean that. I'm really sorry. I've hurt people in church. And I can tell you, I've been hurt by church. You know that the average person loses seven relationships, key relationships in your life. Seven. You will lose seven key relationships, friends, family, whatever. A pastor loses seven a year. But I'm still here. And we're still here. Why? Because we love Christ and we love the body and we love people. I love this shirt that says, Jesus loves you and I'm trying. So here's my point. I get church hurt. I get it. I've given it. But what's the other option? <laughs> you join any organization, they're going to hurt you. Any organization. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not comparing us to anything else. We are the church. We have a higher calling and a higher standard. But what else do we got? We have a choice to either be cynics and throw this whole thing away, or we try to make it better. At Zootown, we're trying to make it better. We're trying to make it better. I think it's time that we embrace the hurt, we embrace the pain, and we forgive, but we be the change. We be the change. The early church was filled with drama. As I said last week, you had Roman officials sitting next to Jews that they persecuted. That had to be high tension in the room. But they were serious about the body of Christ. Jesus didn't die for you individually. He died for his church. And you're a part of that individually, but he died for his church. St. Ignatius said this, if anyone follows a divider out of the church, he does not inherit the kingdom of God. There will always be someone who's upset. And if you follow them, and again, the kingdom of God's now, by the way. But you know what a thing I've also seen? Sometimes people latch on to victimhood. Like someone gets hurt and then they make that hurt their own when it didn't happen to you. It didn't happen to you. Let me hurt you by myself, okay? And you can hurt me back. Let's not follow this, like, woundedness when it didn't even happen to us. Cyprian said this, he cannot, he cannot have God for his father who does not have the church for his mother. St. Augustine was a little more serious. He said, whoever is separated from the church by his single sin of being separated from the unity of Christ shall have no life, but the wrath of God rests upon him. Now, this is why I agree with that statement. Wrath is a passion word. It means God coming after you. So there's a lot of people who leave the church and they're bitter and they're upset and they can't figure out why. Well, it's because God is coming after them <laughs> to bring them back into the church. That's really what this is about, that gathering of the body of Christ and all its messiness. So let me say this again. You have to strip yourself of this American lens of, you know, you're gonna see the fruit, you're gonna feel the fruit, whatever. There are days that I pray and guess what happens? Nothing. Nothing. There are days that I light a candle. Every day I light my little candle. I say the Lord's Prayer. I sit and I focus, and I'm thinking about what I'm making for dinner that night. You know why? Because I'm made from dirt, <laughs> and so are you. There are moments when I feel his presence incredibly serious. Like, I feel it. And then I long and I pant for those moments. And then I try to recreate those moments. And God's like, that moment left, buddy. So my dear friends, there are moments when you come into church and if you're expecting to feel this way, you're gonna be gravely disappointed. Is that why you're coming to church? Here's what faith is. 
I'm coming to church because I'm with my fellow brethren and I'm here to worship God and I trust him for whatever is going to happen. Because the only other option is we're God. That's the only other option. I don't know how this works. It's wine and bread and we pray over it and we bless it and we hope when you ingest it, something happens because God promised us it will happen. <laughs> But we have to break from this American lens, like, well, I'm, I'm coming to feel this way. Well, I'm sorry. You know what I found? Sometimes I'm supposed to feel like dirt because God's doing something in my life. But when we start trying to recreate a moment, it ain't gonna work. So ask yourself, how are you feeling? Well, that's okay, you're here. And then say, Jesus, I trust. You know why? Because he said the kingdom of God is like a treasure buried in the ground. It's like a mustard seed. You can't see it, but it's working and it's growing and it's gonna produce fruit. That's what Zootown Church is gonna be about. Now, let me say this. I think you should come to church more often. If you're watching this online and you're from Missoula, the reason we show this, single moms, sick kids, busy lives, we understand that. But if you're sitting at home watching this in your pajamas every week by yourself, that's not what church is. I'm sorry, if that hurts you, you can turn it off and watch some other church service. But that's not what church is. It's the body of Christ. It's self-giving to other people around us. Hebrews 10 says this, and let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our own meetings, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and even more so because you see the day drawing near. So how did the early church grow? I do believe we're doing this to make room for growth. How did it grow? It told a better story. It told a better story. The, the church started under Roman persecution and Jewish persecution. They had two sides persecuting them and it exploded. How? They told a better story. They would tell people, you know how the Roman government has their thumb over you and you have to do whatever they say? Well, we serve a king who's about freedom and mercy and love and who wants to show you what real freedom is. You know what real freedom is? When the government has you in chains, you can be free on the inside and you can know the risen Lord. It was a better story. That was my sermon last week. We gotta get off the same old story of politics and all that. They told a better story. As I said last week, they didn't go into the, the Roman government and say, you need to stop abortion. They never said that. They went to the fields where they would throw babies and they would rescue those babies and take them home. And some of the guards watching these Christians converted to Christianity because they saw the love of these Christians. They saw the love. When I talk about evangelism, you heard me say, the one thing I break from the Eastern Orthodox Church is they don't evangelize. I believe in evangelism, but I don't believe in you just trying to give someone the right spiel. I don't believe in you just trying to coerce someone by scaring them into the kingdom from hell, right? As Brian Zahn says, evangelism by terrorism. Let's not do that. When I say evangelism, I mean in all of your lives, you know people who are longing for love, who are longing for connection, who are longing to know the living God. And we have four gospels in this Bible. You are the fifth gospel. Most people will never read these four gospels, but they will read you. But where's our focus? Where's our focus, right? So when I say evangelism, I'm not talking about you learning all these crazy things, right? Some of you are like, well, I'm not a theologian. Good, I can tell you most of us theologians just confuse people. And never do I read in this book where Jesus is gonna sit Scott down someday and say, well done, my good and faithful theologian. He's gonna say, my well done and faithful servant. Love God, love people. We started the coffee shop downtown to be in people's lives. And that thing was open for 10 years and there were people who came to that coffee shop every day for 10 years and they never came to church once. Here's one of my favorite stories about Zootown Brew. I was just telling this story. There was this guy who used to help us all the time and he was homeless, he lived in his car. Uh, but he was one of our best volunteers. He, he was a little nutty. 
<laughs> I loved him though. And he would like literally help us pick up these huge chairs every day. But I noticed that some of our orange juices were missing. So finally one day I just asked him, I was like, bro, I don't care. Just tell me the truth. Do you steal our orange juices? And he goes, sometimes, man. That was the end of the conversation. That was it. He's like, sometimes. And he went and lifted chairs again, right? We met all these people because we were with them in their lives. It wasn't to convert anybody. Some people did, some people didn't. It was to love them. And I can tell you, there were people, I've talked to somebody who works downtown next to us, and they said, when you guys left, a light left downtown. How did they know that? We loved people. That's all we're saying with evangelism. A lot of you, many of you, I hear, not just you, I hear tons of Christians saying, pray for revival. Again, what does that look like? You are revival. You are the temple of the living God. You hold the keys to the kingdom. This is what I keep saying. The culture wars are gonna do nothing. They're gonna do nothing. It's the light and salt that Christians are supposed to be. There's this new book out by Tom Holland, not Spider-Man the actor, that gorgeous human being. Tom Holland the atheist. And he studied history and he couldn't figure out what this shift was from the Roman Empire where it was violent and rape was all over the place and there was sexual abuse and women were dogs. He goes, what was the change? And an atheist has now wrote a book called Dominion and he said the change was Christianity. Christianity came in and they taught women, they, they gave women respect. They, they stopped abusing people sexually. They were generous. They said, Christianity, the world we know today, whether you're an atheist or a Christian, was shaped by the love and grace of Christianity 2,000 years ago. My friends, let's recapture that. I wanna be dead and gone. And 100 years from now, they can say, you know what the change in Missoula was? It was this little church called Zoo Town Church. What'd they do? They loved people. They were serious about the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. The number one way, they've done the research. The number one way people go to church is not Facebook, it's not social media, it's not an ad that we do, it's not a billboard that we do. The number one reason people go to church is because they were invited by someone they trust. Only you can decide that. Only you can recognize that. But we are the church, and we're building this for Jesus Christ and for his bride. Band, you can come on out. So next week, we're gonna look at the community, that this is gonna be a community center, but I wanna end on some positive here. I think there's one thing that just keeps going through my mind, and I can tell you, I check myself all the time too. Like when I see so much progress on the building and all those things, I keep telling myself, Enjoy this moment. Enjoy this time. We're always moving. Me, personally, I'm a driver. I'm always moving to the next thing. I'm really enjoying every Sunday. I just want you to know that. I'm really enjoying all of this. My point is, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. As we get to be a part of something awesome. We get to be a part of something big. We get to be a part of something that's not the norm that society is doing. There's this, as the church has moved along, again, they built these beautiful cathedrals and that was for their time and their moment. This is the Sistine Chapel. It will be there hopefully till the end of the age, telling the story of God. Well, that was then and this is now. This is our Sistine Chapel. This is what God has given us. And we will use art, we will use beauty, and we will tell a better story than the story that the world is hearing right now. I wanna show you, this is why I have, I have no nerves about any of this. It's a great place to live. Even this, I really wanted to do this series in October because everyone's coming back from summer in October. Every year we can see it, but we couldn't because time's running out. So it actually took faith for us to do it in September but we believe the people who are hearing it are the ones who are supposed to hear it. That's the kind of faith we have now. But God is with us and God is for us and God is gonna finish the job, but he uses you. You know, when people send thoughts and prayers, I often think God's like, I'm sending you. 
When we pray, I've had people saying, we're praying for money at Zootown. Well, bro, we're not, we don't have a money tree in the back. God doesn't bring dollar bills out of the sky. He uses us. But God has been with us. And I told you about Patricia Van, right? Her and Pete died during COVID. Not of COVID, but they both died during COVID. In fall of 2019, we had a balloon payment of $1.2 million that we had to pay Pete and Patricia Van. And we didn't have it. We had just gone through a church split. We lost half our congregation. Little did we know, six months from then, this little thing called COVID would come. I thought we were done. I had made plans of different places to move. I had looked at buildings around town. And we got a call from Patricia Van and she said, the Lord told me I need to extend your guys' loan for another five years. How does that happen? It's a woman who was very well off kept her focus on God and her relationship on God. And that promise to her that God made that this building would go to something positive, he was gonna see it go through. And I wish she was alive to see it go through, but she extended our loan for five years and it is the reason that we are in this building today. God with us, God for us. But he also used Patricia Van and he's gonna use you. And he's gonna use you. If we can stay focused on the kingdom of God, and focused on what's really important. We have a unique, unique opportunity for such a time as now. Everyone's being like, oh, the world's on fire. Yes, it is on fire, but we're the light of the world. <laughs> now's the time, now's the moment. Let us renew our faith in the church and renew our faith in Christ for what he has for us. Again, I wanna end positive that I, I thank the Lord Jesus Christ because this isn't just a building project. This is a resurrected church. Look around. God has resurrected our church. Statistically, we should have been dead and done for after what we went through. But all God did was tear down sacred cows to rebuild a reformed church on the future of the church. And so I praise God for where we're at. I'm thankful for where we're at. And I look forward to where we're going. But in the end, where we're going is the kingdom of God. And it's right here, it's right now, and we're a part of it. Will you stand as we read the prayers of the people? Thank you guys for everything. I love you very much. If you need prayer, please fill out a card and we will say a prayer every week. For you or for uh, anybody else in your family, we keep them discreet. But let us bring the prayers of, the God, of God before the people. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. We pray for Susan Gross, for her son who was diagnosed with cancer. We pray for you, the great physician, to meet him and to meet her. And we bless them with your presence and we trust you in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for Zootown Church that everything that I just talked about has to come from you, Lord. You are the initiator. We are the responders. So Lord, any heart that's grown cold in here, I pray that you soften it. Any bitterness, any cynicism, any fear, I pray that you break through it and that there's a new way, a new life of peace, that Zootown Church are receptors of your grace, that we are people of action and that we keep the main thing, the main thing. And Lord, I pray for a spirit of humility to go across this place in a spirit of love. Thank you for your presence, which is already here. Our Lord Jesus said, peace be with you, peace I give you. The first thing he did after the resurrection was said, peace be with you, that we can have peace even in the face of death, even in a world lit on fire. Christ offers us that peace, but it starts with us. So no matter where you're at, show each other a sign of peace before you come to the communion table.
Lord God, the Holy One, together with the countless multitudes of angels, we cry out to you and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. The whole earth is full of your glory. Your works are great and marvelous. Your ways are just and true. You form the human beings. You guys can come on up. <laughs> you form the human being from the dust of the earth and breathed into us the breath of life, creating us in your own image and likeness. But we exchange your truth for the serpent's lie and worship and serve the creature rather than you, our creator. And although we had sentenced ourselves to death, you did not forsake us in our captivity. Instead, you showed us mercy. You gave us the law as a custodian, and when the fullness of time had come, you sent us your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And on the night in which he betrayed, he took bread, which he had given, thanks, and broke it, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in memory of me. And the death your Christ died, he died to sin once and for all. And having been raised from the dead, death no longer has dominion over him. Therefore, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's life-giving death until he comes. Now, Father, may your Holy Spirit descend upon us and may the power of the Most High overshadow us and you, the God of peace, will sanctify us completely, preserving our whole spirit, soul, and body blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to you, our God, forever and ever. Amen. Everyone take a moment and just say, to yourself, Lord, I know you're working. Even if you don't feel what you think you should be feeling, Lord, I know you're working. I give you my soul, thy will be done. In the name of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, amen.